Hey there friends, welcome back to the channel. My name is Alex Lokes and Happy New Year. Welcome to 2024. So I decided that this year for this very first video of the year, I'm going to share a little bit about my photography journey. The ends, the means, and everything in between. And what better place to start than here at my old high school? Yes, I am at EC Drury High School. Well, the former EC Drury High School in Milton, Ontario, Canada. And this is where my photography journey started. Now, I've always had an interest in cameras. Um, I come from a family of people who are interested in photography, especially on my father's side. My Opelaux was a huge photographer and his wife also was an avid snapshot. And my dad's younger brother is also a bit of a photography hobbyist. So let's actually go a little bit further along on the campus and I can show you where my photography journey actually started. So it's actually here in this building behind me that I got my first taste of photography. I was in my final year in high school, what at the time we called the OAC year, but I didn't get enough OAC courses to actually get a OAC certificate. But honestly, that didn't matter. The problem was to graduate, I needed a sen senior English course. And I had a hard time writing essays. I hated analyzing Shakespeare plays, but we had a class called Media English and it had a photography unit to it. And I instantly took a liking to this. I was also blessed with the fact that my high school had a strong arts program and there was actually a traditional dark room in the basement, which meant that I got to process and print traditional black and white film because that was really anyone had was film when I was in high school. It also helped that I had a really good teacher, Steve Keen, Keener or the Wizard, if you are from EC Drury, you'll remember his mustache as well. He was also a notoriously a hard marker, but I got really good marks in photography. So after I graduated high school and went to college, I thought maybe I'll take a go of it. So high school got me started in photography, but because I came into photography at the end of my time in high school, it really didn't pick up any steam. I, sure, I picked up my first camera um, at a garage sale, a $5 Minolta Hymatic 7S, and that turned into a Minolta SRT 102. But really, the first place where I started to see any gain, any sort of practice, any sort of skill in photography, was with an organization called the Presbyterian Young People Society, or PYPS. And it was at Knox Presbyterian Church that I really got my first taste of being a photographer, but not this Knox Presbyterian Church. It was actually at this Knox, Knox Presbyterian Church in Oakville, that I brought my first camera to a PYPS event in for the fall convention in 2002. So when I attended my first PYPS weekend in 1999, there was this older member who was there. His name was Rob Ellis. He had a goatee, he had a scalp lock, and he rocked a Canon Rebel 35mm SLR, which was a lot more than what the average PYPSer had. We had whatever point and shoot our families had, we, or we had our own disposable camera. There were no easily available digital cameras. There were no camera phones at the time. But he made photography his ministry because if you appeared in a picture, you knew that you could get a print of that at the next weekend. He always made sure that there was enough of these prints to go around. And it truly made people feel welcome. It made PYPS real. So when I first started bringing a camera to PYPS, I wanted to do the same thing. 
I wasn't that good when I first started, let's be perfectly honest here. I was shooting a fixed lens rangefinder and using automatic mode, like full program auto exposure mode here. You know what? It gave me a start. It taught me how to be a part of the action without directly influencing it. And I can truly see that. And yeah, they were, they were basically snapshots at the beginning. But once I got an SLR and started figuring out exposure and depth of field and working with different focal lengths, that's when I started to see major improvement. And there are several images that I captured that I look back on and go, wow, I actually made that. So at the end of 2005, I picked up a digital camera, a simple four megapixel bridge camera, Konica Minolta d Z2. It was a great camera for someone who was just starting with digital photography. It was finally starting to become affordable, especially if you knew where to look. And it started coming along to these PYPS weekends. And I fell into a trap that a lot of people do when they get their first camera. And that's overshooting because you could. I couldn't bring the same amount of film and get it processed at a fair enough cost. Even in those days when film photography was fairly inexpensive compared to what it is today. Once I went digital, I was back to square one. Don't get me wrong, I don't regret it at all. I was able to capture more images, but I certainly had to relearn a lot of things. And my style did change and grow because digital offered me the freedom to try different things. My early works was harsh, hard, I didn't push myself, but then I started to learn, change things up, exert a little bit more over exposure, flash, and more. And within a year or so of moving to the medium, I was starting to get better images, but I learned to make those changes. PYPS taught me how to photograph people and events, things I use in my wedding photography today. But when it comes to photographing places, the one thing that taught me the most, urban exploration. If you want to learn exposure and composition, then urban exploration is the best place to do that because you're gonna be working with a lot of weird situations. Well, I'd been traveling around doing local abandoned houses for several months before hitting up my first big location at the end of 2005. I was still at that point just rocking that Konica Minolta d Z2, a bridge camera with limited manual controls. And my first results were not the best. The lack of manual controls and a limited focal length certainly did not produce the best images. But even still, it taught me how to better see these places, not just as an explorer, but as a photographer. If there's one phrase that a lot of people like to toss around, it's gear doesn't matter. But I'd like to add something to that. Gear doesn't matter until it does. And as I continue to explore and start to figure out my composition style, I quickly realized that the lenses I was using weren't allowing me to fully execute the vision of these places I had in mind that my brain was telling this is a good composition. And bridge cameras can only take you so far. Kit lenses can only take you so far. I needed something wider. Once I had gotten over the hump and started to invest in both understanding of exposure and better composition, I could start finally getting the gear that I could execute the vision that I had for these spaces. I started to slow down my work, and in a hobby where stealth and speed are an asset, slowing down may not have been the best idea, but I also learned how to change up my gear a little bit more so that I could move faster when needed. And you know, all of these resulted in better images as I went on. Not just better gear, but a better mindset and a better understanding of how to execute the visions I had in my head. I took the exploration hobby pretty far. And by the end of it, I was incredibly pleased with the images I was creating. The problem is, is that the hobby had changed. There was the rise of social media and a hobby that relied on silence suddenly became a contest which who could 
get the best shots, who could get the most likes on social media. And my own life had changed by this point. And I quickly stepped away, faded into the background, didn't make a big deal of it. I just stopped exploring. That didn't mean I didn't stop photographing though. I take a trip. I go to Montreal, Quebec. And you'll have to say that that is truly where photography really started to click for me. And whenever I mention my photography journey, Montreal 2010 is definitely a key point because that's kind of where I figured out how I like to compose my images. And what else do you do as a photographer but wander around the city and practice and play with the various pieces of kits that I had acquired by that point. My Roloflex 2.8F, my Nikon F4, and my 105mm lens. I tried different films, black and white, color slide, color negative images. And I can see that clear delineation point. And I also think that that trip also helped with urban exploration. Because again, you see that clear delineation. I started to get it. Photography really started to click for me. But I still had a bit more to go. And like any good story, mine isn't a straight line because it was through the exploring hobby that I met someone who taught me how to take my film photography to the next level. And that's home developing. So eventually, as one does when they get into film photography, you start to, no, sorry. So up until a certain point, I was getting all my film developed by a lab. I started with uh, the one hour photo lab at the local superstore. And from there, when I started exploring more film formats, I started taking my stuff to Henry's in Toronto and they used a lab called Silvano's. Sorry, no. <clears throat> so when I started shooting photography, I shot exclusively film. And a lot of this film was the cheap grocery store brand stuff um, that I could get at Superstore. It was President's Choice, rebadged Fujifilm product. product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I started working with <clears throat> so when I started with photography, it was film and I shot rebadged Fujifilm, President's Choice brand, and I would take it back to the local superstore, which operated a mini lab. I could either pay the extra and get it back in an hour or, you know, pay the discounted rate and get it back in a week. And I would always get multiple prints and it was a lot of fun. But when I started exploring beyond C41 film, I needed something else. And the Henry's store here in Oakville would mail out their film to a lab in Toronto called Silvano's, a pro lab. And they could do traditional black and white C41 and E6 slide film. I also sent stuff to Parsons, Kansas, to Dwayne's photo, especially when I started shooting um, a little bit of this film you might have heard of called Kodachrome, but I didn't shoot a lot of that. Now, the trouble is, is that Silvano's eventually closed, so I needed to figure out where to get my film processed. This eventually took me to home development. Now, I had done developing and printing a black and white film in high school, but I didn't get into it enough to start doing stuff at home. So it was my good friend, Julie Douglas, who invited me to her father's dark room to learn how to develop and print. And the first results were rough. Especially when it came to scanning them. I didn't really fully understand and again, Nothing wrong, I got images, I got prints, they weren't the best, but when you're just learning, you don't expect to get things done right the first time. And then I ended up going to an event called Photostock. 
Now, Photostock is a yearly event up in um, Harbor Springs and Cross Village, Michigan, up at near the tip of the mitt. And you're surrounded by all these amazing photographers. And by this point, I'd been heavily listening to the Film Photography Project. I'd gotten a whole bunch of cameras, but I was still sending my film away. So I decided with that first photo stock in 2012 that I was going to develop my own film, especially black and white. I can honestly thank Burlington Camera for getting me started on my journey in home development. Joan equipped me with everything I needed from a Patterson tank, Ilfasol 3, HC110, stop bath fixer, and Hypoclear. FPP taught me good techniques, and my first role solo was okay. Not the best, but I got working images. Eventually, I got my temperature under control and my technique. And by a roll of Tri-X developed in HC110, I was hooked and never looked back. One of the best parts about home development is that even today there is a ton of amazing developers out there for exploration. And the most important part of the whole thing is gaining that confidence in working with film. Yes, I still make mistakes, but I've gotten a chance to try out some amazing chemistry. Adox FX39, Diafine, 510 Pyro, Atomol 49, and many more. But more importantly, I have improved my technique, taken risks, done some experimenting, and made the process my own. So I've been doing this home developing thing now for 10 years and I'm really happy with it because I have control over my own workflow. I'm not depending on a lab to pick whatever chemical they use. I'm not relying on someone else to develop my film and to give it a look. I try to, as best as I can when I go into a situation, figure out what my final results will be. And from there, I tune it to the film and the developer I'm using. And a lot of times, I'm just trying out something new, um, seeing what I can get. And the most important thing is take notes. Figure out which ones you like, which ones you don't like, and where you need to tweak it. Start with the listed data sheets. Start with whatever's on Massive Dev Chart or whatever other film developing website you, you use, but then tweak it. If you feel that the time listed makes your negatives too dense, drop it down. If you feel it underdevelops it, bring it up. Try different methods, try constant rotation, try stand developing. The important thing is that you make your film developing your own because the way I do it might work for me, but it might not work for you. And if you decide to use what I do as sort of a foundation and tweak it from there, fantastic. Then I'm doing something right. And there is better living through chemistry. There is a certain satisfaction that comes with developing your own film, taking it from start to finish, and then from there, maybe taking it into a dark room. I know I don't get into a dark room enough to actually print, but that's my reality right now. But I know that every time I have made a print, it's been really worthwhile. If there's one thing home development did is that it freed me from using a photo lab. And that opened up a whole wide world of different films and different formats of photography. And one of the ones that tested me the most was large format. Yes, again, this is really thanks to Matt Marash at the FPP and the folks at Photostock. They shot these beautiful large format cameras. Matt shot an 8x10, but I saw a lot more people rocking a 4x5, which was a little bit more my speed. So a trip to Rochester resulted in me going into a very famous camera store in Rochester run by a chain smoking Dutchman by the name of Dick Ross. And I picked up a heavily modified anniversary speed graphic with a 203 millimeter Kodak Ektar lens. And the first three sheets I got were not the best. They worked 
And I mean, I had bought a Pentax Spot Meter 5, I had bought Ilford HP5 film, I'd gotten a roller tank to do all the developing in, and they worked. The images were just a little bit lackluster, but if there's one type of photography that will test you as a photographer, it's large format because there's no safety. But like any photography format, the best way to get better is to practice, practice, practice. And I was lucky because I was connected with a very open group of film photographers who shot large format, who were more than happy to answer my questions. And probably the best thing I ever did was shooting a sheet of film a week for an entire year. That's an entire box of Kodak Tri-X, which today is a lot of money, but when I was doing it, it really wasn't that bad for 50 sheets plus two borrowed from a friend. And I got better, not because I paid money and took a course, not because I instantly knew what I was doing. I made mistakes, I took a plethora of notes, and I forced myself to get out there and shoot and try new things, take inspiration, just doing it. And yeah, that's, that's really all there is. There's nothing better to improve your photography than practice, practice, practice. So one of the most important things I did with my large format journey was making it my own. I took inspiration from these other photographers. I learned from them, but ultimately, I used it in ways that I was a lot more familiar with. I didn't just shoot landscapes, I took it into urban environments where I am primarily comfortable in shooting. That's where my subject matter is. I used it handheld a couple of times, not my favorite. I prefer to use it on a tripod, I feel a little bit more closer to the, uh, the format. And ultimately I made it my own, and while it doesn't play as big a role in my photography these days. I'm still very happy with how I use 4x5 and what I use it for. 2015 was really the year everything changed for my photography. I started to write more organized blog posts. I started to write more about photography and the cameras that I used and the films that I shot. And all the skills I had learned culminated with making a very important print to give to who would become a very important person in my life and still is today. So you could say up to 2015, everything was foundation. That was the, that was the core of my photography, the skills, the techniques, and what I learned now could become something a lot bigger. And it's made a huge impact on my life. One of the best parts about the internet is that you can build a community of like-minded people and meet people not only globally, but locally who share some of the same interests and passions that you have. Two of the earliest communities that I was involved in are Photostock and the Film Photography Project. And both of those have yielded a ton of amazing connections and friendships out of it but it also inspired me to start building those communities myself. The first one being in 2013 with the Toronto Film Shooters Meetup, built out of a need for a more film-centered photography meetup group, group within Southern Ontario, originally just Toronto and the GTA, and we have pretty much expanded. We have members in both across Canada um, and even a few in the United States who have made the journey up to the area for photo walks. And out of the Toronto Film Shooters meetup came the Classic Camera Revival podcast, which got its start in 2015. Now, 2015 was a very special year for me. Um, first off, I started doing a lot more serious work in writing about photography and film photography and cameras, but I also made a trip of a lifetime to Europe where I participated in the 200th anniversary reenactment of the Battle of Waterloo. 
I had a lot of fun that first week and then I took two more weeks to start touring around Europe. And the first Monday I found myself in the community of Arras in northern France. It's about a 45 minute bike ride away from another very important location to Canadians in northern France, Vimy Ridge. So on the Monday it rained, but I decided that I wasn't going to let that stop me. So I loaded up my Contax G2 with a roll of Kodax Tri-X and I went out and did some photography in the horrible weather. And one brief burst of rain, I found myself at a awning hiding from the worst of the weather. But I also thought like, hey, you know what? Maybe something interesting is going to come along here. And sure enough, it did. And I captured a very iconic photo, a photo that I was able to then bring home, develop myself and make a print in a dark room, which, you know what, doesn't really mean much on the surface. But I ended up making a print for a very special woman whom I had met through a Bible study group and that got us talking. Um, her name's Heather. And if you know me, you know that we ended up dating and getting married. So all I can say is that sometimes you don't always see what some of these things that happen in your life, what they can turn out to. And really since that, I have an amazing um, partner, wife in my life who continues to support and encourage this wonderful hobby. I have continued to write blogs. I do a YouTube channel now and the Classic Camera Revival podcast has grown and changed over time, but it still continues. And it took a long time to get my blog, CCR, and my YouTube channel to the point where it is today. It's not an instant overnight thing. It sometimes takes a lot longer to get where you want it to go. And it's important to just have patience to let it happen. So that's it. That is my photography journey from those first stumbling steps in 2002 up until this year, 2024. And it's been a wild ride. If there's one thing that I want to say is that don't think of photography as a sprint. It's not about learning quick and getting rich. It's not about making it big. It's not about going viral. It's about enjoying the process. It's about enjoying every moment, figuring out what you like, what you don't like, having a lot of fun along the way, making connections. You have to remember that from when I started in 2002, it wasn't until 2015 that I started seriously blogging about my photography. It wasn't until 2015 that I started my own film photography podcast. Yes, I had appeared on the FPP a couple times and that really sort of laid that foundation and doing a bit of writing here and there. And I still feel that I am, I am always learning. I'm always looking to improve. I don't want to learn quick and get rich. I want to have this photography thing be a marathon, make it a lifelong journey. So let me know in the comments, share a little bit about your journey. What places have you felt really inspired you or you feel that that is the point where you get that aha moment, where photography truly clicks. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I'm very happy to say that I have cracked the 1500 subscriber mark, which was my goal for the end of last year. And I look forward to sharing more about my photography. I got a lot of really great things lined up for this year. Again, I'll be putting out two videos a month. They'll be released on Wednesdays. And yeah, hit that bell notification icon to let so that I can let you know when my new content drops and give me a thumbs up. And thank you so much to everyone who has commented, liked, subscribed over the course of this journey of mine here on YouTube. And I look forward to talking to you more. And as I always like to say, shoot what you love with what you love on what you love. Don't give in to the hype. <laughs>